hello and uh, welcome to the 58th New York Film Festival presented by Film at Lincoln Center. My name is Maddie Whittle. I'm a member of the programming team at Film at Lincoln Center year round. And uh, with my colleague, Devika Girish, I have co-programmed the talk section of this year's festival, which have been conducted entirely virtually, uh, accessible around the world, all free. And uh, it's been a really exciting program of talks. Uh, that is actually wrapping up with the talk you're about to see this evening. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. Uh, the talk uh, for today is called The Artist, the Athlete, and the Revolutionary. It's uh, on the occasion of two films that we are screening as part of the revivals section of the festival this year. Terence Dixon's Meeting the Man, James Baldwin in Paris, and William Klein's Muhammad Ali, The Greatest. Uh, these two films were both supposed to be screened in the drive-in double bill this evening, uh, but unfortunately due to weather and safety concerns, that screening has been rescheduled at the drive-in for uh, Tuesday, uh, October 13th. So if you weren't able to make the drive-in this evening, but still would like to try and catch it, you have a couple more days uh, before that happens. And also the, both films will be available on our virtual festival platform uh, starting this evening and running for another five days. So you can catch them virtually, if not at the drive-in. Uh, so getting that out of the way, I'll say a few words about the festival. Uh, the New York Film Festival has always been about bringing the community together to celebrate cinema. And whether you're joining us uh, in our virtual cinema from New York today or from anywhere around the world uh, or coming to our drive-in uh, screenings. Uh, on behalf of everyone at Film at Lincoln Center, thank you so much for being part of this historic edition. Uh, thank you to the Film at Lincoln Center board, patrons, members, and the dedicated moviegoers who make our work possible throughout the year. Uh, as a nonprofit, we rely on your support, and becoming a member is a great way to join our community of film lovers. You can take advantage of discounts and special offers uh, while also helping us to continue sharing the best in cinema with New York and the world beyond. Uh, if you're not a member, you can please do consider becoming one today. You can find out all about that on our website, filmlink.org. I also wanna make sure to recognize the tireless efforts of all of the staff and volunteers who've been working behind the scenes to make this year's festival a reality. It's truly been a team effort unlike any we've ever uh, put forward before. And it's been exciting and rewarding to be part of even for all of the challenges. And we thank you so much, uh, our audience for joining us. It's been, uh, over three weeks of drive-in screenings and virtual cinema offerings, and uh, it's just been a real joy. You can continue to access the festival, even though technically yesterday was closing night and today is the last official day of the festival, but you'll be able to con continue to access some of the virtual screening offerings uh, online starting this evening, and uh, you can also revisit the free virtual talks that have happened throughout the festival. They'll all be posted on our YouTube channel eventually, so you can catch up with them there. Also on the Film at Lincoln Center podcast, many of the Q and A's and talks will be uh, offered uh, as audio. Uh, so be sure to subscribe to our newsletter, uh, which not only during the festival, but also year round, uh, will keep you abreast of exciting updates and announcements. And uh, you can, Follow along on the conversation from this year's festival on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook with the hashtag NYFF. Last but not least, a special thank you to our many festival partners, most especially to, uh, HBO, the presenting partner of Film at Lincoln Center talks year round and uh, New York Film Festival talks during the festival. And again, uh, to everyone joining us, thank you so much for being part of this conversation and uh, for attending the New York Film Festival. Uh, I'm not going to say too much more because I want to leave ample time for the conversation. Um, but I will say that if you're listening along and you'd like to submit any questions uh, for any of our panelists or for the panel as a whole, you can submit those uh, via the Q&A text box, which you can access uh, from at the bottom of your Zoom frame. And finally, because this is our last NYFF talk for 2020, uh, my colleague Devika and I and our producer Kuros uh, want to join you all to raise a glass at the very end of this talk. So uh, if you're watching from home, maybe have a drink handy and we will all uh, see you on the other side of the talk just for a celebratory toast. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, Nicholas Russell, 
uh, who's joining us, I believe, from Las Vegas. Uh, he's, he's a writer, uh, along with the very illustrious panelists that we have with us uh, for this conversation. And so I won't say too much more, but I will hand it over and uh, Nicholas, take it away. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, it's great to be here and moderating this panel to be sharing space with all of you. Uh, Maddie already did sort of my intro. I'm a freelance writer uh, in Las Vegas. Um, you can find some of my work in The Believer, Columbia Journal, Reverse Shot, uh, Film Comment, among other places. Um, I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves. Um, first off, we have uh, Kazembe Balogun. Uh, good evening, and um, just special thanks to the uh, staff and uh, of the Lincoln Center. Uh, my name is Kazembe Balogun. I am, what brings me to this talk tonight is that um, I'm a native of Harlem, uh, just like James Baldwin was. Um, I changed my name um, in my early 20s, like Muhammad Ali did. Um, my work is located within the Black radical tradition, um, and I'm really excited to talk about Ali and Baldwin as Black internationalist activists. Um, my current work right now is with the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, which is an um, uh, international policy, public policy organization that's affiliated with the left party of Germany, and I do work on uh, racial justice and Black liberation, both here in the United States, but also in Europe and in the South. Um, in addition, I'm also a writer and a cultural historian um, and, you know, and I'm um, writing and thinking about um, Black arts through a socialist framework. So I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. And Rich? Hi, good evening. My name is Rich Blint. I am a professor at the New School where I teach a literary studies program. I also direct the program in race and ethnicity. I am a long time Baldwin scholar, um, but also a scholar, as Kazembe and I go way back in New York City of the Black radical tradition. I'm really happy to be here and to talk about these really seen films and say maybe some relevant things about their contradictory kind of provenance. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thanks, Rich. Soraya? Hi. Uh... So I'm Soraya McDonald. I am the culture critic at The Undefeated, uh, which is ESPN's platform covering race, sports, and culture. Um, I am, you know, doing my best impression of, of James Baldwin in the film that, that you'll see, at least sartorially speaking, which is why I've got on my, my black turtleneck and my silver necklace tonight. Um, and I'm just uh, really happy to be here. And again, many thanks to everyone at Film at Lincoln Center. Sure. And last but not least, Samantha. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I am Samantha Shepard. I am a professor of cinema and media studies in the Department of Performing and Media Arts at Cornell University. And I am the author of the new book, Sporting Blackness, Race, Embodiment, and Critical Muscle Memory on Screen and a longtime lover of spectacles, both visual and ocular by the number of prescriptions that I own. And I'm um, very, very glad to be in this conversation with such um, um, esteemed and distinguished voices. And I look forward to the Q&A as well. And thank you to everyone at Film at Lincoln Center and to um, our host and um, interlocutor. Thanks guys, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, for the audience, um, just so you know, the this talk acts as sort of a preview to the documentaries that we're talking about, which will be available in a couple hours. Um, we're talking about Baldwin and Ali, but I think generally we'll be talking about a lot of other figures in black radical tradition at large, especially as it pertains to this year. Um, the documentaries pose very different uh, depictions of their subjects, um, specifically Baldwin and Ali's very different relationships with their celebrity. Um, so the first question I wanna ask, which is a very broad question, but I think applies to both of these documentaries and the people they're about, is what does it mean to be an important black public figure in society and if, celebrity is maybe the wrong word to use for um, important black, like prominent black figures, 
you know, uh, how, how, uh, what is the burden that is placed upon black individuals when they are called upon to comment on the entirety of the culture? Um, anyone can answer. I think uh, Baldwin in the documentary very much um, disagrees with the line of thought that he is an important person and wishes to be a witness. Um, and that's something I thought was interesting. I'd like you guys to talk about that. Do you have any thoughts? I'll kick us off. Um, I thought, I think it's a really great question. I think that both of them are dealing with celebrity probably in the terms of, I would say like of the racial icon and what Nicole Fleetwood says about the ways in which the racial icon is made to stand apart and, and stand for. And so there's a duality that's playing out with both of them. Um, one that I think that Baldwin in the documentary is, um, is much, it's much more um, rhetorically um, agentive in the rebuttal of the tension between the two. Um, both in terms of what his agency as a writer is and, and how he sees himself um, in relationship to Black communities and, and the cultures of thought. Um, and with Ali, I think that there is there is a sort of totemness that ends up um, being created through even just the narrative itself of being the greatest and we're watching um, a progressive um, rise. So there's an, there's an interesting way in which the film itself is negotiating the way in which he himself both stands apart and stands for as this really unique um, 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 black athletic icon who, who doesn't transcend space and time, but who, who traverses space and time in a really interesting way in the documentary, both from black and white to color, which was a really interesting shift in and of itself visually. I mean, if I could jump in, thank you for that, Samantha. Um, it's a great question. I think it's a matter of then and now, right? Um, they both have very complicated ideas, um, relationships to their celebrity. In the film, meeting the man, James Baldwin in Paris, I mean, what they're trying to do is to traffic in Baldwin's own celebrity. And he says, I'm not interested in my 20 years in Paris. I could be Bobby Seale. I could be Angela Davis. And in that statement, um, which Terrence Dixon refuses somehow, well, you can be your Jimmy Baldwin. And Baldwin is trying to say, I could get shot tomorrow, that the state the American state, is in, which he says is another word for Chase Manhattan Bank, right, um, will take me out. And I think that knowledge interrupts short circuits, familiar, convenient ideas of celebrity. I think Baldwin's ability to say that then, only two years after all those shameful and famous American assassinations, is really important. It's also important to know that Liston dies in 1970. Right? That Malcolm X, who we see in the film in 64, is dead a year later. So I think it's much more significant for us to periodize celebrity than and now. And to think about what celebrity the moment before the 1980s and Reagan's idea of capitalism and where we are now with a kind of neoliberal, austere version of it, um, where everything is on the table for commodification. So, I mean, there's so much to say about celebrity and um, how as we all know already, the lead is in terms of someone like Kaepernick being compared to Ali. But I think it's really important the time we're talking about and also the movement and what kind of movement is circulating, circulating around these individual figures. You know, that's what I would say. Thanks. I would say um, the thing that struck me, oh, shoot. Um, Kazembe, why don't you go ahead and I will be right back. I'll just jump in for my dear sister. Um, so I think one of the things that really struck me was the fact that, um, you know, Rich kind of talked about the movement that was circling around these individuals and how Ali and James Baldwin joined the movement, right? And they took direction from the movement and they saw themselves as part of a broader, uh, bigger narrative than themselves. Um, and you can kind of see that in terms of like the first film with James Baldwin in Paris, when you have that very beautiful scene when he's in Buford Delaney's studio and he's talking with like the black youth, right? And he's hanging out with them and there's a, there's a level of like friendliness and love that's out there and it's like 
the colors from Buford Delaney's paintings are radiating everyone's faces and Baldwin's really into the deep uh, congregational feel of him preaching. Um, and there's something there that's really like about him being there and being accessible. Same thing kind of funnily with the Ali film, the um, Ali Klein film, with the William Klein film, Ali, where like there's a scene in there where it seems like a fan is just kind of rolled up to Ali's uh, uh, motel and kind of knocks on his door and is like, um, do you have that book for me? Like, do you have a book? Like, can I, can I buy the book for you? And like, Ali's like, I don't have any books, you know? Um, you know, I'll talk to this guy. And so there's a whole way in which um, celebrity was not necessarily meaning separation from the community, but celebrity meant like, I'm using this platform, right? And I'm gonna give you my platform to amplify the needs of the community and the people. And I think that particularly now um, in this Black Lives Matter moment, um, you know, we can think about ways in which amp amplification is so important right now in terms of these messages. I want to give Soraya a chance to come back and also respond to the question, but I do think, um, thank you guys for your answers. I think the idea of celebrity and this prominence in, as a Black figure, not only to the Black community, but the white community at large, the white population of Europe and um, America, it necessarily seems to separate certain figures such that after a certain point in time, it can feel like they are divorced from the community that they are from. And I think that is something that Baldwin really is struggling against or fighting against is this idea that he is somehow he doesn't want to overstate his importance in the community, even though he is important to the community. Um, and something I think is interesting in both films is uh, the degrees to which Baldwin and Ali focus on blackness or whiteness. Um, hi, Soraya. I wanted to give you a chance to, um, to say your piece. So sorry about that interruption. Um, Yes, what I was going to say was that, um, you know, one thing I noticed, particularly with, um, with the Baldwin documentary um, that I feel like carries through to today, uh, you know, if we're talking about someone like Colin Kaepernick, um, is his frustration um, with the person who's trying to interview him. And actually, this shows up in the Ali film, too. Um, d like, it's almost, like, it's unavoidable how much everyone who is covering them, um, as journalists, as photojournalists, as writers, um, you know, the television camera crews, they're all white men. <laughs> um, and you can see sort of Jimmy's, like, palpable frustration um, with a person who's trying to interview him um, and who clearly like doesn't even know sort of where to begin with him. Um, <clears throat> and I think you find that a lot, um, particularly with black public figures who are speaking about civil rights, um, who are being covered by largely white press, um, is that there is this frustration with sort of having to explain yourself over and over and over again, um, that the ideas that you've already sort of put forth, um, whether you've written about them or if you've spoken about them um, in any sort of way, um, you still get these questions, well, is that what you really meant? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think what's interesting about um, about Baldwin is that like he just he does not have any time for this sort of like faux politeness um it, like he's just extremely sort of irritated and impatient with this man and it's not until you see him with this group of like black youth um that he sort of actually starts to like come alive and you see something um in him besides just being annoyed um you know, and I think there is, you know, he has something in common with Muhammad Ali in that way, you know, who is throughout his life, like very, um, like celebratory, like just love children and being around children. <laughs> um, you know, I think part of that is, is 
frankly, because they just don't ask the sort of like dumb questions um, sometimes that you will see uh, from these um, from these white interviewers. You know, the other thing, and it's not just the questions, it's also the way like the story of these men and their lives are framed. Um, you know, the thing that we see like very early on is this narrative that develops, um, you know, when Ali wins his first um, world title uh, and already he's being called ungrateful. Um, like this is the thing that he has to sort of navigate, you know, that basically like follows him all the way through to his death. Um, you know, and you can see something similar now with the professional athletes who have decided to speak out, you know, I mean, to the point that you have LeBron James producing an entire documentary called Shut Up and Dribble, which is in response to, to Laura Ingram basically telling him to do the, just that, you know. Um, you know, when we think about how the president has castigated um, NFL players for um, kneeling during the playing of the national anthem in protest of, you know, murdered black people. Um, I get, you know, what does he say? He calls them sons of bitches. Um, but there's always this uh, dynamic of, you know, the moment that you start to sort of speak out um, in any sort of critical way about your, your country, um, you're immediately labeled as ungrateful. That's, yeah. I love that story. Um, to go along with what you're saying, I think there, there's a really great part in Ali's documentary where he goes on this very poetic list of all things great that are white that I wanted to read a lot because it, it's too great not to, uh, not to highlight. Jesus, Santa Claus, Tarzan, King of the Jungle, Miss America, Miss Universe, Miss World. When you go to heaven, you walk on the Milky White Way. Before you go to heaven, you're washing lambs blood until you're white as snow. They teach us in TV commercials. They have white owl cigars, white swan soap, uh, king white soap, uh, white tissue paper, white hair rinse, white flow wax. Everything seems to be white. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Angel hair is white. Angel food cake is white. And devil food cake is dark. Mary had a lamb whose feet is white as snow. So everything in the greatest so far has been white. And these are just falsehoods of white supremacy. Um, it's both incredibly refreshing and like sort of galvanizing to hear that. And also very frustrating because it seems like the same thing has been said over and over and over and over again, particularly this year, where we are reifying this idea that we are in a world that is white and white in ways that are not obvious but even those obvious things continue to not really be acknowledged the way that they should be i think one of the things that's interesting about watching these documentaries especially this year is obviously they're relevant to the moment um but i think I'd like to step outside of the question of relevancy because I think they'll always be relevant no matter any point of like political upheaval or turmoil. I wanted to ask what you guys think of the relationship between um, advancing black political agendas and the relationship between having the white public be um, allies to that movement. It seems this year, you know, with all the anti-racist reading lists and this idea of like white people doing their homework, um, are we, is, is the focus there in the wrong place? Like, should we be focusing on educating and sort of bringing white people up to speed? Or as Baldwin seems to say, that stuff's already been there. There's no reason why you shouldn't already know this. I mean, Nicholas, I guess I want to <clears throat> speak to that directly. In the film, Baldwin says to Terrence Dixon when they finally get themselves together and they get back to the Algerian bar, and he says, well, you're writing for white people. And he says, I'm writing for people, baby. Um, and there's a way to kind of, he's trying to racialize Baldwin's readership. And this, this foolishness, it just comes up in the Dick Cavett interview about this idea that somehow 
um, things are getting better for the Negro. And, it's, and Baldwin says in that Dick Cavett interview, which has made us rounds all across um, YouTube and also in Raul Peck's amazing documentary, what he says is it's, it's really foolish to kind of talk to you, basically, as long as you keep using this kind of peculiar language. And the language is peculiar because you're pretending that things are what they are, um, how the, you, because you think you're white, you can pretend that what is going on and proceeding on the ground doesn't happen. You can fool yourself about some things that black people cannot fool themselves about. So there's something about your question, Nicholas, which is interesting and, and also kind of frustrating, right? There's something about the question of white people and black people and you know, trying to get them to learn more in this fiction in the, of allyship, right? The language is peculiar again, which just prolongs this endless chasm, like this kind of, oh my God, it's so difficult to understand what's going on. I think white supremacy is white supremacy has always been very clear and the stakes have always been high, but also crystal clear. And there's something about, I think, these documentaries themselves, which is what is a short circuiting that happens in Meeting the Man and also the peculiarness, the, the peculiar nature of something called the ungrateful, right? All these men, you know, running TV companies, cool viceroy, um, just the power of American capitalism, but also white supremacy are pretending, you know, that we own the cashless place, what they're saying. They're pretending that the kind of relationships of power aren't what they are. And this kind of clutching of pearls around the kind of minute, infinitesimal, momentary truth-telling that comes from a Kaepernick or from a Ali, we can't really compare them to Baldwin in that way, is somehow absolutely shocking, right? Um, when it's, it's anyone in the barbershop would have told you the same thing. But because it's being amplified, um, to say they're sons of bitches. And so I guess what, what these two films confirm to me is the kind of bad faith as, um, the writer was saying about of, of journalism, first of all, with black life and the truth about black life, but also um, a kind of sleight of hand, rhetorical and, and otherwise, of presenting certain people as a way not to really talk about problems in black and white America, not to really confront white supremacy. It's this endless like extending of this fictional figuring out. And I just want to kind of just lay that bare. And I'm not saying that that's what you're doing, but it's a kind of familiar question about like what's going on here about white readership or white viewership versus black. Mm -hmm. And I want to just kind of say in the films themselves, we get Baldwin, you know, just rending the veil of that and saying, no, actually, something else is happening here. I just want to pick question. up on something Rich said, um, because I think. You know, if there's anything that's dispiriting, it's how much, like, these dynamics continue, you know, like, apace with just different characters. You know, you have Ali and Kavit, and, you know, if you fast forward to, I don't know, last year, um, or the last time that ta Coates was on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, um, and Stephen is you know, like very eagerly sort of like pressing him to um, to give this answer that, you know, he is hopeful in some way or he is optimistic about the future of the country. And ta is like sort of very politely like pushing back on that, um, you know, because it sort of runs counter to, to everything that he's written. <laughs> um, you know, this sort of this kind of Pollyanna view of America. Um, and that's not to say, you know, that anyone should be fatalistic, and I don't think Tom Hussey is. Um, but, you know, it's, it's so clear that you have folks over and over and over again who are demanding um, that we look at things with a sort of realism um, that and usually somehow that goes through this prism where this, you know, sort of very polite request that you be realistic about things becomes that you're difficult. Um, you know, that you are somehow, you know, I think if you're a person who doesn't know anything about James Baldwin or frankly, you know, really doesn't know anything about America and you watch this documentary, 
the thing that you're going to come away with is, wow, that guy's a jerk. Um, as opposed to, you know, having some sort of base of understanding for his frustrations. Um, and, you know, this is a dynamic, particularly with sports figures that you see over and over and over again um, in the way that they are, you know, when they try to bring up serious issues and we end up sort of discussing around them um, for, you know, or tone policing, you know, they're, uh, they're not doing something the right way. Oh, they shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't be protesting, you know, on the field during the national anthem, or they shouldn't be protesting, you know, they shouldn't have Black Lives Matter in the NBA bubble um, on their jerseys, or, you know, there's always something. There's never really sort of like this perfect way to protest. Um, and I think one of the things that's really interesting has been watching someone like Naomi Osaka um, because she, so first of all, she grew up watching Venus and Serena Williams, right? Like they were like very clear um, inspirations for her. Like her father basically modeled um, how he taught his daughter's tennis after Richard Williams. Um, but the thing you see with Naomi Osaka and the masks of these murdered black people that she wears at the US Open, um, you know, which is sort of this kind of public performance in itself, uh, you know, when she wins and Tom Rinaldi, you know, asks her, well, what were you hoping to achieve? You know, like, what, who are you hoping to reach? Or what are you hoping to achieve? Or what are you trying to say? You know, rather than sort of getting sucked into um, this sort of circular discourse that never seems to go anywhere, you know, Naomi, um, you know, very intelligently says, well, what did you get out of it? You know, she turns it back on him. Um, and I just, you know, like looking at sort of the way that modern athletes are using their voices now um, and the way that they are sort of picking up on this legacy left by athletes like Muhammad Ali and thinkers like James Baldwin and artists like Nina Simone. Um, that, you know, gives me, I think, some optimism um, because they have realized sort of what the game is and they're like, okay, well, we're, we're going to take this in a different direction and you're just going to have to, you're just going to have to keep up. Um, and just to piggyback off that too, I mean, I think the one thing that hits me when I talk about both of that is that what Fanon said is decolonization is violence. Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, there's that one great scene and where Baldwin's sitting in front of the Bastille, and he's talking about, you know, this is the prison of the white imagination. Why did why did white people feel that the necessity of tearing down this particular um, this particular prison? And we've seen a whole entire summer of folks like going out into the streets, tearing down monuments, right, and tearing down monuments of slavery, and tearing down monuments of degradation of black people, particularly of black women, and you know, and so all this is all about, you know, the right to rename and to claim yourselves. And you know, and and, this, and then there's the, the part that I think Sariah mentioned or Rich mentioned in terms of like the living monument of Cassius Clay, where that 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 one of the owners of his camp says, well, you know, Clay is a very prominent name of slave owners, and you know, my family probably owned Cassius at one point. And he says it was such it was such a grin, cigar smoke coming through, and all this other stuff. And so this whole entire process of like you know. Of, of black activism at this point is not only just around economic equality and political inclusion, but against personal degradation, right? And so, you know, and so the resistance that, you know, you see in the Black Lives Matter movement is, is really a, a, a call for a, a common humanity in a real deep sense, you know, in the tearing down of this white imagination. And so, and there's also a point, the last thing I'll say, if we step back a little bit too, we have to really kind of put Baldwin and Ali in the context of inter black radical traditional internationalism, because you know Baldwin's specifically fighting his specific beef with Paris is post Algerian Revolution, right? And Ali's and, you know and and also connected to that is also France's connection to Vietnam, which U.S. also imperialism also goes into as well, which Ali also picks up that thing. So I think that you know they're kind of pulling a thread out there saying that. You know, this issue on blackness is also global in a lot of ways. And that, you know, and that, you know, that, that movement towards 
Black Lives is not just located in the United States, but all over. I'm Black everywhere. I also want to add to that point, which was so beautifully stated about thinking about them as global, global figures, ones that are monumental in our sort of historical frame, but also um, in terms of a kind of reach. Something that really struck me about particularly the Ali documentary is the sort of polyvocalism of it, the, the ways in which there was just so many different um, um, voices that were were captured both in terms of, um, of language, but, um, but also because the one thing I will give credit to um, in Klein's piece is that I really think that there was an undercutting actually of that moment of the ownership of play and this history of uh, the syndicate putting it down together. Not only because the win is so significant after in separating him and as a kind of a figure beyond um, the need for their support, but also there's that long, long tracking shot um, with that um, that man who I don't know who he is, um, who's, who's talking and trying to explain to the filmmaker like what kind of black person they want Ali to be and who he is. And that's why there's tension. He's trying to explain that scene. And he's trying to say, and that actually reminds me of like what happens in the Baldwin doc. And I'm, I'm sure Rich can actually probably speak more to this being a Baldwin scholar. It's that he says, you can't teach me anything. Like this is what we are watching. We're watching this version of like, I'm trying to tell you something. You did not see what you saw. What you saw was something else. Um, what they don't like is this. Um, and so that's why I say it's polyvocal because I enjoyed the bits where it was just so much black people just talking and being and you're just trying to capture and keep up. And, um, and I think that's really an interesting part of Ali's film towards this idea of, of what he's doing. It's all about the framing and then the reframing, both the framing within popular discourse and then also the way he, he challenges you to reframe. He reframed his own moment when he's about to fight Foreman. He says, oh, you saw me standing on the ropes on the side? Oh, I was playing you the entire time. I know how to dance. Like it's, it's the frame and the reframe. And I think it's really interesting because if we tie that back to Baldwin, what does he say? If I'm trying to get out of jail, I'm lip um, I'm liberating myself, you're saying I'm savages, right? And so it's it's about breaking again those dominant molds and frames that are trying to capture, which I think if we think about the element of capture, this was such a beautiful film, um, particularly for me, of looking at the footage of Ali, but it's like, he's like, there's so much that can't be captured that it's interesting, again, I don't know if it was licensing, that we couldn't show the fights, that it then goes to the photographic um, in an interesting way about thinking about some of the things that just cannot be, um, cannot be visualized or understood in terms of the spectacle um, and the spectacular nature of, of who he was, is, moves, means, all of those things. So those are just my thoughts. It's beautifully said, Samantha. And to echo what you're saying, you know, um, Baldwin uses the word irreducible when talking about what it is that he is trying to convey or what it is that he stands for, I think, Often, especially this year, I'm seeing so much of, you know, Baldwin being espoused as an important figure, but being espoused as a standalone figure that, you know, is divorced from history, is divorced from other movements, is divorced from anything that doesn't have to do with what people are, see as recognizably Black. And the Ali documentary speaks to this so much more, one, because it's longer, but two, because it just stand, spans a much greater period of time and granularity of what it means and what it can mean to be so many things to so many different people that it is literally impossible to define that person um, unless you are commodified, which I think Ali as a sports figure and as many Black sports figures are, are commodified as something to be um, as far as you're saying, you know, as something to be ignored or as, as a person to be a specialist in one area only, which has nothing to do with what you stand for, what you actually believe in. Um, one last question before we uh, throw it over to the Q&A is I wanted to talk a little bit more about this idea of um, the Black radical tradition uh, as something that is 
is often mistaken for something that is an American tradition as something that is specifically applying to the United States when, you know, I have so many friends who are uh, black journalists in Canada who are Haiti or France or, um, you know, Asia, where they are talking about movements in such a diametrically opposed way than we are here. Um, there is so much less focus on whiteness, for one. Um, there's so much less focus on the uh, litigation of why these people are or are not doing things correctly. And there's more focus simply on the material demands that are being uh, made by these people. Um, what do you, f I, I'm just curious for the panelists to talk about what they see, how, how they see the, the movements of this year and years past, specifically in this country and like the way that, you know, it's been covered, I should say. Um, I mean, I think that's a really important question. I mean, one of the things um, that I think is, is potentially liberatory to placing the movement for Black Lives in the U.S. in relationship to what goes on in in France, for instance, what the response to um, the Windrush scandal in London, um, what's going on in Latin America that's sending caravans of people over here. I mean, it's, go, it's the kind of um, internationalism that characterized decolonial movements in the 1960s and 50s, and even in, the, in 68, right? Not too long before some of these were filmed, um, or after some of these were filmed. So I think the myopia of American exceptionalism is really troublesome about both in terms of um, how black or vanity, black music circulates globally through the circus of capitalism or capital and um, how that then can stand in as surrogate for all of the movements for equity and freedom across the world, you know? And so I think it's really crucial that somehow, I'm not sure how we do this, given just the place we've landed, that we recall um, exactly what you're saying, Nicholas, is where Kazemi began, that ethos, that practice of internationalism. And there's one thing I want to say, just to get back a little bit to what Samantha and everyone was saying before about that scene, about Baldwin saying something in front of the Bastille about the contradiction between criminalizing the movement for Black Lives um, that's been going on for centuries, um, and then extolling the French Revolution and calling it heroic. I think that Baldwin enacts or practices refusal in that first part of the film in a beautiful, beautiful way. In the ways in which black, white journalists or journalists generally don't have a clue how to, how to speak to someone as interesting and as intelligent as James Baldwin. Baldwin interrupts just a normal protocol, right? He refuses, he shuts down. And he says, um, the man is referring, and this is Terrence Dixon, and I know Jack is and the DP, and he will talk at some point about what, what happened to Terrence, but there's a moment there where he's saying he's shooting in front of the Bastille for a particular reason. And um, he said, don't put the camera in my face, man. And, and then um, he engages him, and the, 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 you might remember the voiceover, and you'll see this in the film, Refer to one of them were was particularly dominant, and if we talk about a pride of lions, right? And Baldwin is having this kind of smile that you know I've seen all my life of just you dumb what you know, and um, and it's like frustration, but it's also like look at you, um, and he says, well, I know you don't know anything because of how you talk to him, meaning that young black man. And there's something about using your celebrity in that way that so many people in contemporary life don't speak that directly because they don't want to interrupt their brand. They don't want to be canceled or whatever it is. I think that practice, that enactment of refusing protocol and Baldwin saying you are, you know, mediocre young person, but we don't get this together before we all move it all. And, you know, and he says at some point, you remember, he's like, well, I got to talk to somebody. I can't talk to you. And they go back to Buford Delaney's house, which is his spiritual father. There's David Baldwin. And then they begin to do the film then. I have to give them all credit for leaving all that stuff in this 30 minute film or 28 minute film, because what would you have? But to Sarai's point, if you know nothing at all, and people have said this when we first screened 
me and the man on the survey we had organized, me and um, Jake Perlin back in 2015, that Baldwin was clinical. I said, baby, no, he's not clinical. He's just, like, he's appearing mad because somehow he's stepping outside of what, how he's meant to enact. And that goes back to that long shot of that Black man saying, baby, they wanted to be grateful and all this. You know, so I guess I'm saying all of this to say that um, we have to begin to speak the truth when we see the truth. And then we can maybe get somewhere, you know. But yes, thank you for that. Um, did anyone want to elaborate on that or I can go to the Q&A? Um, there's some interesting questions here. Um, I'll, say, I'll say one thing, um, which is just like your question and, and the way we're talking about it reminds me of um, an interview I did with Saul Williams um, years ago when he was promoting a book of poetry um, and he'd spent time in France um, working on it um, and, uh, you know, when we, when we talk about sort of this, like, American myopia that a lot of times we don't even realize we have, um, you know, he would say that friends would come visit him there, um, and be sort of astounded that they didn't have, like, Black friends, Black American friends would come visit him, and they'd be astounded that they didn't have any problems. And like the, the way that he characterized it like has stayed with me ever since. Cause he was like, wait, you mean I'm not the star of racism? <laughs> um, <laughs> because of course, right, you know, there's this line, uh, you know, where Baldwin says basically that, you know, the, the Algerian in France is the nigger in America, um, you know, and basically sort of over and over again, um, you know, depending on, on what country you're going to, you know, that's, that's what you're looking at, right? Um, is that you have this sort of, you know, even if you are a black person in some places, you have this American privilege that you take with you. Um, and that, you know, one of the things I've noticed about um, the artists and writers who I speak to now, um, you know, I actually just, had a conversation with Sarah Broom um, this weekend or Friday. And, you know, I was asking her about if she saw herself as like an, a, a Southern American writer. And she said, yes, I do. But I also see myself um, as a global Southern writer. Um, and, you know, when I think about particularly, you know, because these things get very thorny, you know, when you think about sort of the contrast between the way that NBA, sorry, NBA players um, reacted, say, to the killing of George Floyd or um, Jacob Blake uh, versus, you know, the sort of um, authoritarian crackdown that was happening in Hong Kong where the NBA was basically sort of forced to backpedal because they have these huge um, monetary interests uh, and expanding the NBA to China, um, you know, it really brings into focus, like, okay, like, who actually um, are we standing for? Like, is, you know, and in coalition with, um, and what does that mean to do so? Thank you for that, sir. I also, um, oh, Kazemi, please. Just really quick, I mean, this is why I made me, I mean, so I made me think of something real quick. Um, I think that one thing I really appreciate about both these films is that, you know, the title of this talk is The Athlete, The Artist, and The Revolutionary. And I think both of them are artists and revolutionaries. And you can't really, like, think about Ali without thinking about his literary contribution to American letters. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, if, if he was around today, maybe he'll be known as a, a content producer because one thing I noticed in the film is that, you know, I know you made that face, but, I, you know, he's bigger than that. But I want to say that one thing I noticed in the film is that, you know, there's, there's, there's a moment where he's, he says, float like a butterfly sting like a bee, and all the kids are saying it. And towards the end of the film, um, you know, you have all the kids in, in Kinshasa saying, Ali Bumbaye, Ali Bumbaye. And I think one of the things that I really realized is that this particular moment of connecting internationalism has to, has to do with the technology that's available, which is the hashtag, 
right? And so the Black Lives Matter hashtag has been acting as this kind of universal umbrella to allow people to have um, shared experiences, but not the same experience. And I think that, you know, minority means something so different in America than it does mean in Europe. So I think that, you know, we're, we're a nation of 30, close to 30 million people that has a bigger boom. And I think what we do across the black world has such an impact that we don't even realize sometimes that, you know, little kids in Germany who may be the only black kid in Germany in that little town is watching BET somehow. And they're like, all right, now I'm down with it. I get it, you know what I'm saying? And I think that the way that Ali had operated at that time was kind of creating that universalism and so was Baldwin in a lot of ways too. And so without that technology, so I think that's really great. I also want to just point out because I think that, um, you know, um, Ali's a really interesting figure because of what you just described, his rhetorical production that becomes a kind of revolutionary consumption and the way in which he has been so packaged and repackaged um, as, as product, um, within product and through product, um, digitally re-inscripted um, in commercials, um, he gets to fight against his own daughter for, um, you know, um, a, a Nike commercial. Um, all of these kinds of ways. I'm, I'm interested in sort of the through line that's, that's being produced here, but I'm also thinking this is someone with so much hyperproduction at the same time that it, 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 it troubles our, our understanding of his rhetorical production with the ways in which he is consumed. And I think that's a really, um, that's really interesting because there is both revolutionary literacy um, and there has been so much racial capitalism. And that's the kind of tension that's also playing itself out um, with the film. That's when we see um, Don King, you know, and it's like, you know, we're here in Zaire, we've got all this imagery, we've got, you know, it's just, it's so much. And that's that kind of tension that it's, um, that, that Ali also conjures because he's like a beacon. So it's like it's putting into circulation all of these circuits of power, of money, of, of so many things that that the film to even digest that film is 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 a lot. I, I made the mistake of trying to watch it in one day. Um, it was it was a lot. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll cut out so we can get to the questions. Thanks. No, thank you for that, Samantha. Also, you know, um, the brief segment with Malcolm X talks about psychological effect that Muhammad Ali has specifically on black kids. This and the idea that, you know, uh, I think he says there will be trouble from the Negroes because they see someone who has no reason to be apologetic about being the best. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, capital placed on, you know, being able to prove that. And with Muhammad Ali, you have really nowhere to go because the, the record is there and, and he's able to recognize that. Um, for the chat, so some of these questions are interesting and I, I'm gonna collapse them a little bit because there are a few people who are asking kind of the same thing. One question I'm seeing a lot is people are asking about the quote unquote responsibility that black artists, athletes, um, you know, prominent black figures have to speaking to the moment. Um, I'd like you guys to go ahead and answer that or reframe that question in a way that feels better to you. Cause I think we are, it is another common question that I think is a misleading one. I mean, can we just be honest about how misleading that question is, right? I mean, this idea of responsibility goes back to prolonging, it seems to me, this endless figuring out, this racial sussing out. Um, we all have a responsibility. Um, the question I think people are asking is how much responsibility does a person have? Well, how can he or she as a sports figure both keep their money and tell the truth about race in America? That's what they're really asking. And that's always a question. It's like about celebrity and black life and wealth. And Baldwin tells us America has always been a kind of dishonest custodian of, about black life and wealth. And that's what the question is really asking. We all have a responsibility here in different platforms to speak explicit truth to the power we know defines and orders our lives. So do people who are making money over and over again in complicated ways. I mean, Don King is literally suggesting, as he talks about being pay, paying people $5 million each, that it's about this reconnection on the continent. 
Um, no, there's much more going on here. That's about the spectacle of black masculinity and the room it's allowed in the context of white male authority, which is American life. And so, I mean, if once we can talk a little bit about those contradictions I th and try to kind of, you know, overhaul them. But I think the question that people are asking with, without being rude is people saying how much can people like Kaepernick or anyone else speak the truth and still get paid? Um, because that's one of the hustles available to black people music, you know, sports and the rest of it. So I think that we can just really, as you were suggesting, Russell, um, Nicholas, um, tell the truth about <laughs> what is really being asked, then we can actually be begin to get somewhere, you know? And I think it's like, I don't know, responsibility is such a weird word. Um, because basically, I don't know, you know, how much responsibility do any of us have to tell the truth about our lives as they are lived. Um, it sort of reminds me of a few years ago um, when it became very popular to ask like every seeming um, female celebrity if she was a feminist as a sort of gotcha question because there was never a follow-up after that. Like, you know, it was just like that was in it, like X says, like she's she's a but she's a humanist, not a feminist or whatever. And then that was the conversation, which like drove me nuts. The thing is, is that like, okay, you know, setting aside women like say Amy Coney Barrett, um, I'm not really interested in that question. I'm interested in you know like what is the responsibility of white people to think about and do something about systemic racism? Um, you know, the same goes for homophobia and sexism. Um, you know, like this is, you know, I feel like Baldwin has, has communicated this in so many ways. Like his being black is not a problem for him. It is a problem for white people. Like they're the ones who have something they need to fix. So, you know, if anyone bears some sort of responsibility, um, it's them. <laughs> it's not black people. Um, but but yeah. <laughs> I agree. I think the the question is a misdirection um, because it it wants us to do the labor of saying either applauding the kinds of work that um, people have done. Um, while recognizing that the majority um, have done nothing um, by not recognizing at all. Um, so, of course, it's, it's wonderful to, to look and see um, who is asked that question because nobody asked that question of the WNBA because it would be, the answer would be both too great and it would realize we have not covered this issue for any time. Um, and so I think it's, it's that kind of, it's a, it's a misdirection of like, oh, we are now doing this. And then you can create a kind of lineage. And I loved how Baldwin said, America is so obsessed with progress. <laughs> it's like, it just wants to chart progress. It is just like Nielsen ratings. Oh, we got a 2% share and we've made it just a little more there. It's like, if I can show you where the end was, you wouldn't think you had gotten that far. Like, it's just that kind of, um, um, misdirection. I do like to, to just return and to take a question and do what I want with it, which is, the, the, again, the artistry actions of them is what is so interesting. The way revolution um, takes multiple forms and in multiple mediums and medias is really, really interesting. So I think what does it mean to um, to embody or to orchestrate or enact an agentful um, um, revolution, whether that be personal, political, social or athletic is, is what is, is, is a more interesting question because it asks you to look at craft, it asks you to look at labor, it asks you to look at work, it asks you to look at training, it asks school of thought, community, those, those things are illuminative. Um, that, that shines a brighter light than a spotlight. And that's, that's interesting to me much more. Now nah, y'all killed it. I'm gonna let you keep it as asking about this question because y'all killed it. <laughs> um, the last question I'll ask, um, which there were a lot of really interesting ones, uh, I encourage you guys to look through the Q and A just to think about them, is goes along with this question of responsibility. 
and ties to this year specifically this idea of instruction, this idea of how to be a certain person, specifically how to be a certain white person, how to be a responsible white person, how to do everything that you can to like really not be white. It seems like this is like this idea of like, how can I divorce myself from a legacy that makes me so uncomfortable that I would rather not do the work of, as you were all saying, you know, engaging with the text that they are saying that they should be engaging with. Um, Baldwin, you know, and, and Ali represent so multifaceted, multifaceted individuals wherein to focus on one thing that they've said, read, written, saying, done, is to engage with a very long lineage of other things that people have done the same thing with. And I think this year has seen a lot of people trying to reduce certain texts, specifically textbooks, down to something that can be taught, something that is teaching white people and non-black people how to behave, how to think, how to engage. And I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on you know, the prizing of, of black thought as something that seems to only be ready for commodification as a way to help white people, which is not at all what these things are. Oh man, I feel like every like black celebrity, every black person who reaches like some level of celebrity like ends up coming up against this, right? I mean, this is this is why we have no more Chappelle show. Um, <laughs> basically, right? I mean, you know, there is, you know, after a certain point, um, I mean, we saw this with ta where he basically was getting criticized for being like, you know, white liberals favorite, like black writer and thinker. Um, Oh God. Um, so, you know, I've, I've gotten like some version of this question in a lot of panels that I've done this year. Um, and the one thing that I always bring up is there is an app called Your Black Friends Are Busy. And it is literally like a tool that does the things like all the sort of like emotional and intellectual labor that you are maybe asking your your one black friend to do, what should I read? And then what should I read after that? And then, you know, how should I think about this? Like there's an app for that now. Um, but the other thing is like, you know, it would be nice if people were just more sort of thoughtful about this. Um, you know, on you know one level because this is exhausting <laughs> um and there are so many more interesting things to do and talk about um the white supremacy like somehow white supremacy and the way you know mixed with capitalism just ends up making white people these stars of racism <laughs> still right because it's like oh how do i how do i remedy my whiteness um I feel so ashamed. Isn't that enough? Um, no, no. What is, be useful, right? Like, I, I'm not really interested in anyone's sort of guilt or self-pity or, you know, whatever. Like, if you, like, I'm glad, you know, on the one hand that, like, when, you know, I'm not glad, glad is the wrong word, but, you know, if we're talking about sort of, like, the New York Times bestseller lists in, like, July and August, right? Like, I am certainly happy for, you know, my friends who are either, <laughs> you know, if they're not getting residuals, they have at least, like, earned out their advances. <laughs> like, great for them. Um, you actually have to do the reading. <laughs> like, you can't just buy the book and then be like, okay, I'm, you know, like, I have... I have completed, you know, my sort of like good act at combating racism. <laughs> like, no. And the thing is, the last thing I would say is that like, if you are white and you are not uncomfortable, you are probably doing it wrong. Um, so I would say like, seek out spaces um, that make you uncomfortable. And sometimes that means talking to your virulently racist relatives who you don't want to talk to. Um, right, because, because 
because race is such a taboo for so many white families and it's like okay let's just not let's just not engage well you're gonna have to engage right because again like black people are not the people who need fixing <laughs> Um, so this, you know, it takes a lot of, you know, willingness to, to, you know, interrogate yourself um, and, you know, and, and not want to be sort of like patted on the head for that. <laughs> All right, that's, that's much better. There's an app for that. Um, um, I think that's amazing. <laughs> First of all, I want to say, because usually I just tell people, I was like, you can write whole sentences in the, into Google if you need assistance here, because somebody has already helped you um, uh, algorithmically. But, um, but I think that, that those were many, many good points. And I really want to underscore probably as an educator to, to do the reading um, and to do the reading is, is laborious work. Um, so it's, I, it's, it's, you gotta want to work. Um, and that's what I have seen many people, they want results, but they don't want the work. And as an infomercial lover, a person who wants a good quick fix, <laughs> um, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the work is, the work is out there. The work has been done. People have been packaging it, repackaging it, um, giving it to you visually, giving it to you all of the ways. And one has to ask oneself truly how much work has one put into learning the work. Um, and, um, and yes, and also if you have if you have if you have never had a, a real deep or depthful conversation with a black woman, you have not gone free yet. So um, continue to do the work. I would probably say, yeah. And and what I would say is that I mean, um, I think that you know you can't. First of all, I was, I think that you have to understand that Baldwin and Ali would never put out the work that they put out without the trust that you can put yourself back together. Because you, you can't come out with a novel like Another Country or Giovanni's Room or say the things that Ali said without this idea that there's some sort of redemptive hope of people being able to receive it and shift the way they were thinking. And I think that that's also manifested in the way that we demonstrate today. You know, the demonstrations, the mass gatherings, the, the vigils, the say her name, all this is, is, is a way of forcing people to do this type of work that we talk about. Um, but I just want to say that really, I think the thing for me is that someone mentioned tone policing, and I think the invoice of that is like um, of, 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 um, of, of, of doing code switching and like, you know, and policing your own tone. And I would say for black youth today, don't do that. <laughs> You know, like, you know, and look at and think about how brave James Baldwin was in cussing out Norman Mailer and Robert F. Kennedy. You know, so so rather than code switch, be polyphonic, you know, and hit the many and not the few. And I'll say that that's something that I think that and then and then allow your truth to be the space where other people can pick themselves up and gather themselves and, and trust and trust people in that process. I mean, if I can say something really briefly, um, this is encapsulated, it seems to me, in teaching my people when Baldwin is talking to Dixon at the Algerian Cafe, and they're talking about another country, which Baldwin says um, is about love, and it says the price of love, which is the price of life. Um, and he says that people don't seem to know that, because Terrence seems to think that people have always been in love. And Baldwin says, have they? They wouldn't have treated the children the way they do. And not to give everything away, but there's something that comes up, which is really crucial, it seems to me, is um, when Baldwin in that moment says, love has never been a popular movement and no one's ever really wanted to be free. And he says the world is held together, really it is held together by the love and the passion of very few people. And this idea of freedom is, is it's to refuse those nonsense categories the ball has been fighting, fighting against all of his writing life about white and black there's no such thing as he understands he said this in the film but he knows what it means to be a white man at that point in the century so that kind of nimbleness that embrace of contradiction of what i call a kind of concrete abstraction i don't believe in your race or your gender give that back to you as we've been saying it is your problem but i know how to stay alive 
So I need to know and not kid myself. So, but that is in contradistinction to this endless, and we've all been saying this, you know, just searching infantile, juvenile fiction about, oh, tell me how to be a good white person. Maybe there's something about those things that can't be reconciled, you know? Maybe that's something we should think about some more, that the actual contradiction might lie in that original misnaming that gives Clay his last name, you know? Anyway, it's been an amazing conversation. Thank you all so much. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, I think we're gonna wrap up, but thank you guys so much. This has been such a fruitful, thoughtful conversation. I really encourage the audience members to watch these films and to engage with them beyond wondering if you liked it or not. I think liking these things is beyond the point. I think this is what we're speaking to. The work of studying the work is, not really prized, and I think it is not something about earning points, it's about um, learning and bettering, and you know, really understanding and kind of questioning what those things can be um, and what they can do. I, um, I really wish that we could go on much longer. There are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of avenues for us to have talked about, especially with sports, but um, uh, I wanted to bring in Maddie and Devika. Uh, I think we're gonna do a toast. Um, since this is the last panel, but again, thank you guys so much. This has been amazing. Hey, y'all. Well, thank you so much. That was just absolutely brilliant. Uh, I feel like I just learned so much and not a single word was wasted. And this is just the best finale we could have ever hoped for. Thank you all so much for being with us, um, for our brilliant panelists, and also for our audience for tuning in, for engaging with really thoughtful questions. Nicholas, thank you so much for, for the excellent moderation. And I just couldn't have imagined a better way to, to round out the talks program for this year's New York Film Festival. So thank you all. And I will raise a glass to you all. Thank you. Cheers. 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 And I have to say, um, I think I just saw an update that actually there are free uh, tickets being given away for Tuesday's drive-in screenings of both these films with the code drive-in. Uh, there's more details on the Film at Lincoln Center social media channels and page, but you know, so if you want to go see those films, this might be a great way to do that. And I hope a lot of people see them. And thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. This was a pleasure. Thank you. It's so wonderful. Much. Thank you so much. Y'all are so brilliant. Awesome. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see you all again in our theaters soon. Yes. Take yes. care. <laughs> in lieu of taking it to a bar, we'll just That's have right. to That's make right. do with this. And yeah. Saludos. Thanks all. Be good.